different tongue positions and their malocclusions. It's well known within dentistry that the teeth sit in a balanced position between the tongue and the cheeks and the lips, which then draws the obvious next question. What malocclusions, so what various different teeth positions can be related to tongue positions? And here's some graphic concepts and illustrations. <clears throat> the first well is not really a malocclusion, it would be an ideal occlusion with an intermolar width approximately 42 millimetres, the tongue fully up into the roof of the mouth at rest, a nice broad wide dental arch, a shallow palate, usually a uh, um, horizontally developed uh, face with good bone structure and good features. I tend to see this only naturally occurring in a few individuals with strong muscle tone often brought up in less well-developed countries and then relocated to where I'm practicing in the UK. Um, <clears throat> if they will usually have their wisdom teeth present working in function if they have wisdom teeth and they usually do have wisdom teeth. And an excellent occlusion. Um, they fulfill all of what we refer to as agri six keys, the way the teeth bite together properly. Um, the next example, example number two, is, uh, I, I do see this, this would be the wider variety of the occlusions that I would often see. Again, it's not really a malocclusion usually. Probably have got crowded wisdom teeth. The tongue's down a little bit, intermolar widths around 37 millimeters. Um, they can have a little bit of lower incisor crowding, um, maybe the laterals, the tooth number two is a little bit rotated, sometimes a slightly retroclined um, upper uh, incisors. Um, usually pretty good general facial shape and um, very low need for orthodontics. Um, the example number three would be the classic um, from class 1 malocclusion or even class um, 2, even mildly class 3 malocclusions, where there's a, approximately a 30 millimeter intermolar width. Uh, you, with that, you'll have a, a moderate amount of crowding, um, usually. Um, and the tongue's size would be down from the roof of the mouth. It sits midway in the mid space of the um, oral cavity. Um, might go up onto the roof of the mouth for swallowing, might not go to the roof of the mouth for swallowing. But this is classically what I'm seeing when I look at the um, uh, people coming in to see me. So the individuals who are attending my clinic, I'll see an intermolar width classically somewhere between 29 millimeters and about 34 millimeters. That seems to be the standard for the children coming to see me, and often really for the adults coming to see me as well. Now, we, then we move on to um, example number four, and the difference between example number four and example number three is that example number four, um, people with a much higher um, uh, bite force. So these people are doing what we call tongue splinting. So the tongue's between the teeth, but they're biting on it. And they're maintaining a high bite force. And they often have a slightly wider intermolar width, um, sort of 34 plus millimeters. But the teeth tend to be tipped inwards because the maxillary development is greater from the forces running through the maxilla. But the teeth are tipped in partly because of that sucking action. The tongue between the teeth, the power of the tongue is going between the teeth, but the um, lips and cheeks are still exerting their force which is driving the teeth inwards, tipping them downwards and inwards. And this is classical of the um, um, class 2 division 2 um, deep bite cases which are, they're often the same. Um, and you can really see some markings on the sides of the tongue when the tongue is relaxed in cases like this. Now the Last, the fifth example we'll give is 
a situation where the tongue's really low in the mouth. The tongue's really actually dropped very low down. It's in the floor of the mouth. Now these individuals are nearly all class three individuals. So by placing the tongue in the mandible, the lower jaw, you can hold the tongue forward out of the airway. And this allows a comfortable airway, but it allows the top jaw to collapse completely. And the bottom jaw to be held forwards, and over time the bottom jaw will become longer and longer and longer. At about under about 10, maybe, but usually under about 10 years old, I don't think the bottom jaw is truly larger than it ever should be, but beyond then it can truly get larger than it should be, and we have a real jutting out chin, a class, frank class 3 situation. Now it's important in understanding this to understand what the, the, these are compensatory tongue positions and understanding the concept of craniofacial dystrophy and how these compensatory mechanisms have an interplay with airways and the underlying pathology of malocclusion.